Let's get this party started. Let's get this party started. Let's get this party started. It's a Bible reading party. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey. Good morning. How are you doing? Make sure my microphone is on. Ooh, we. Ooh, we. <laughs> I should probably be more upset than I am this morning, but I'm not. Ooh, there's a delay. Good morning, good morning, good morning. That's so weird seeing that delay there. Good morning. Oh, let me forget. I almost forgot to hit record. Okay, I did not forget to hit record. So good morning, everybody, to whoever is in the room, because something very strange is going on today. I'm going to show you in just a second. I should be a lot more upset than I am, but I'm not. Hot. I'm not upset at all. I'm curious, but I'm not upset. I refuse to be upset because... It really is out of my control. So for anybody coming in here today on Facebook, watching me read the Bible, funny thing is, I do this every day. I do it at YouTube. Today, I, took, I tried to go live on YouTube. Sorry, this top is not going on there. This morning, I tried to go live on YouTube as usual. And I kept getting this strange message. Oh, man. I got somebody that I sent a link to, and they're not able to get on Facebook. Really, 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 really sad. I don't know what's going on with Facebook, but in either case, I'm going to show you guys a quick video that I made. It's like a one-minute video. Because I wanted to have proof. You know what? I should have took proof of something else that happened recently. But I didn't. So I'm going to show you guys what I saw when I... I'm going to show you guys what I saw this morning when I tried to get on to my YouTube account. See that? Live streaming isn't available right now. That's what it says. Live streaming isn't available right now. And there's a way you can check your account to see if like maybe you messed up or did something, made a mistake, broke a rule. And if you break the rules, they can take that away. See, my account is good. I have zero copyright strikes. I have zero community guideline strikes, which means I didn't break any policies. But look, your ability to live stream has been revoked, disabled. <laughs> yeah, so that happened. Yeah, that happened this morning. Uh, something else strange happened two days ago, and I didn't think anything of it. I had a one minute, I had a one minute video where I was, um, my Wi-Fi went out. My Wi-Fi went out, not just mine. The Wi-Fi went out in the neighborhood and the company had to come out and do whatever they did. And so I couldn't live stream for technical reasons. And so I got on a third party and I was setting it up. And the first time it didn't work out properly. I was saying, hey, everybody, I'm on here. My Wi-Fi is out, so I'm coming live to you from my phone. It was like a minute long or less. And it was a false start. So I just went live again, and it worked out. I got, what did they tell me? I was ch checking out my account yesterday, and it says, your video cannot be shown. Your video has been taken down. And it was that one minute video of me saying, hey guys, I have my Wi-Fi's out. I gotta come and do this, this stream yard thing. And they put not a strike against me, but they basically penalized me for a one minute video that said that the Wi-Fi's out, so I'm coming on live. So I appealed it. I appealed it because I hadn't broken any rules. 
I did not break any rules. And they got right back to me and said, yeah, it the, that standing is going to stay. You you broke whatever community guideline rule and your thing is going to be deleted. It was it was trash. It was a little one minute piece of a um, video where I was literally saying, hey, guys, my Wi-Fi is out. I'm going to come to you live from my phone. Strange, right? Very strange. But in either case, when I showed you that video, I don't have a strike against my account. I didn't break any rules. I don't have any guidelines that I um, violated. But that's that. And so I was using the last 15 minutes trying to figure out what was going on. And apparently, you cannot, <laughs> you can't repeal this. You can't appeal it. So I'm not going to be able to go live on YouTube for the next 90 days from that channel. I could use my other channel, but I'm not going to because whatever is going on, I don't want it to spill over into my other channel. But yeah, that's that's very strange, isn't it? I start a new Bible reading channel. I'm having issues in the beginning. Things go well. Then I get my privileges revoked. Interesting. Very interesting. But in either case, we are going to read the Bible today. I'm hoping that some people will be able to come on here. And if not, then I understand because not everybody's on Facebook. I'm looking for that uh, email. Because I just want to show you guys, like, there's no reason for me to be banned from there's no reason for me to be banned from um going live but something's happening something weird is happening i don't want to spend too much time on this because i need to be reading the bible that's what i need to be doing here we go this is my thing All right, I'm going to show one more thing. If if for no other reason to document it to the world, I didn't do anything wrong, but this is my um this is the email that I got from uh from them. And of course, that's from my new channel Boulevard 40 where I'm pretty much just reading the Bible. Thank you for submitting your video appeal to YouTube. After further review, we've determined that your video is in violation of our community guidelines. For more information, please visit the YouTube Help Center. We apologize for the delay, yada, yada, yada. And of course, when you go to the Help Center, they don't tell you why. They just give you a list of reasons um, why they do it, but they don't tell you why they did it to you. Strange, very strange. That's okay. What I'm going to do is I have software on my computer where I can record it. And so for you guys able to check me out right now on Facebook Live, here I am. I'm going to be reading my Bible like I do every day regardless. This is my New Believer's Bible. I need to be, but I'm not used to going live on Facebook on my computer. But this is my Bible. This is what I use. This is the New Believers Bible compact version. First steps for new Christians. Ooh, that lighting needs to get a little bit better. There we go. That's better. So this is what I'm reading. This is a modern read. And um, this is my compact Bible dictionary. Nelson's compact series. I use this almost every day. And what I would normally do if I was on YouTube without all this weird stuff happening, what I would normally do is, is tell you guys what day it is, what time it is. And so here we go. The time is now 8.04 a.m. Wow. I normally start at 7, but uh, whatever's going on is going on. It is now 8.04 a.m. It is June 9th, 2020, and it is Tuesday. Yes, it is Tuesday. It is Opportunity Tuesday, 
And here I am reading my Bible because um, I can. <laughs> and if you are new to me reading the Bible, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I do this every day. Uh, if I can find a way, I'm going to do it every day. And so here I am on Facebook doing it instead of YouTube. Uh, at this point, I would probably uh, go through my roll call because on YouTube, I got people coming in the room and I acknowledged them. And so far, the only person that I see <laughs> is my sweet sister, Kiana. So hello, Kiana Nicole. <laughs> this says, bless the like button. And I don't even know if there is a like button here I because I'm not used to going live on Facebook, but I guess it, I guess there is. But bless the like button and good morning, 40 fam. And yes, at this point, oh, there is a like button, isn't there? I'm going to like myself because I like myself. <laughs> okay, at this point, what I would do is do a screen share of my study guide. I don't know if I can do a screen share here on... I don't know if I can do a screen share here on Facebook. It looks really choppy. I can tell that much. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do a screen share, it looks like. But what I can do is tell you. I'm going to go to my Kindle Cloud Reader, and I'm going to... Oh, you know what I can do? If I got it on my phone, I don't think I do. We're in week 24. It's the 24th week of me reading the Bible in a year, reading it every day since January 1st. And let's see, we just started week 24. Here we go. Week 24 is talking about division and unity. I wish I could share, show you the uh, screen share, but I don't think I can do that on Facebook. Um, but the theme for this week is division and unity. There's division going on in the Old Testament with uh, under the rule of King Solomon, who's the third king of Israel. And then when we jump into the New Testament, we're going to talk about some unity. Since I'm just now reading this for the first time on Facebook, I'll go ahead and I'll break it down to you. Uh, I really wish I could give you a screen share, but I don't think I can. And I don't think I've got Kindle on my phone or else I would show you my Kindle. Um, but this is what it says. Uh, the guide that I'm using is called a woman's guide to reading the Bible in a year. If you're a man, I'm pretty sure you can find a very similar guide, a man's guide to reading the Bible in a year or a teenager's guide to reading the Bible in a year. This just happens to be the one that I downloaded. And it says here, to protect his people, God had commanded that they not marry foreigners and that the king should not have many wives. But Solomon chose not to obey God in these matters. And toward the end of his reign, the impact of his decisions could be seen. Solomon compromised his faith and joined his, joined his foreign wives in worshiping their gods. God told him that as a, res, as a result, the nation of Israel ultimately would split apart. Um, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remained with Solomon's successors and became known as Southern, the Southern Kingdom, or Judah. The remaining ten tribes rebelled against Solomon's son, Rehoboam, over their, their heavy taxes and forced labor and became known as the Northern Kingdom, Israel. Jeroboam soon led Israel into idol worship. Despite warnings by God's prophets and efforts, of some kings in Judah, the people of the divided king moved farther and farther away from obeying God. Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus near the Aegean Sea focuses on the spiritual blessings given to all believers, the unity of all who believe the body of Christ and the behaviors and responsibilities, those blessings that unity require. So that's what's going on in the New Testament with Paul. He went, that's what, you know, in the book of Ephesians, he went to Ephesus or Ephesus and that's what happened there so we got breaking apart and unity breaking apart and unity division and unity and that's what we're doing this week so yesterday i read first kings seven through nine today i'm reading uh, first kings 10 through 12. and again if you would like to get caught up you can head over to youtube as of as of yesterday i was fine i don't know what happened today i don't know why i got revoked but um the show must go on. Ain't no monkey gonna stop no show. 
And right now, and as a matter of fact, now to think about it, YouTube has a little monkey emoji with a wrench whenever something wrong happens. It's like, oops, the little oops monkey. Ain't no monkey gonna stop this show. Cause ain't no party like a Bible reading party. Cause a Bible reading party don't stop. I said, ain't no party like a Bible reading party. Cause a Bible reading party don't stop. Hey, oh. Okay. So this is a recap of what happened yesterday. Yesterday I was in chapter seven, eight, and nine in First Kings, and I read about Solomon building his palace. I read about furnishings for the kingdom. I must have read ahead somehow. Maybe not. There was preparations for the temple, building the temple. In either case, this is what I should have been reading yesterday. Seven, eight, and nine. Uh, Solomon builds his temple. There's furnishings for the temple. Um, the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the temple. Solomon prays for, uh, dedicates the temple. Solomon praises the Lord and then uh, does a prayer of dedication. Uh, there is the dedication of the temple. And then in chapter 9, the Lord's response to Solomon. Solomon agree, does an agreement with Hiram because Hiram is a king over in Tyre and, um, or the city of Tyre, the land of Tyre, the kingdom of Tyre. He's made an agreement with him previously to bring in this cedar and I can't remember the, the name of the other word, Cyprus. Cyprus and cedar wood from Lebanon to help build the temple. And they had a you know pretty good arrangement. And now it's time to pay him back. This was the funny part yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, um, King Solomon gave King Hiram 20 towns in the land of Galilee. That's what happens in chapter 9, verse 10, or verse 11. He gave 20 towns in the land of Galilee to King Hiram. And King Hiram saw the towns and was like, he was not pleased at all. He said, what kind of towns are these, my brother? But he uh, he called that area Kabul, which means worthless, and it's still known today. Nevertheless, he pays Solomon 9,000 pounds of gold. So for all the work and effort that King Hiram uh, offered, he did receive 20 towns. I still don't know what was going on with those towns, but he was not pleased. Then it talks about Solomon's many achievements in chapter 9, and then that brings us current to today. So today is chapters 10, 11, and 12 in the book of First Kings, and let me check in with my Facebook people to see if anybody has come in. I hope they have. Uh, yes, I do. Okay, I've got, <laughs> I got, I got my regulars coming in. I don't know what happened to YouTube, you guys. YouTube, they got me today. So Laverne Dorsey came in and said, "No monkey or devil." I'm telling you, you know, there's a little, there's a little, uh, there's a little YouTube monkey. That's what I'm saying. And I got revoked. I don't know why. There's no reason for me to have gotten revoked. But yes, my my live streaming privileges are revoked for the next 90 days. I cannot live stream from YouTube for the next 90 days. Isn't that something? For reading the Bible. Interesting, because there's nothing else that I do on here. There's nothing controversial. There's no language. There's no obscenities. There's no nudeness. There's no lewdness. There's nothing going on but me reading the Bible. So that's interesting. Um, unless maybe somebody reported me and like if I'm under investigation, but what would they report me for, for reading the Bible? Again, very, very strange. Yeah, there he goes. That's the YouTube monkey that I'm talking about. That's why I say ain't no monkey gonna stop no show. That's the YouTube monkey that pops up when there's an issue. You get that 404 message or something. It'll be like, oops, something doesn't go right. But um, I didn't get the monkey. I just got that message that I showed you guys a second ago. I took a picture. I took footage. I did tweet to the YouTube team. Um, I don't know if they'll listen to me because that channel is not monetized. And if you're not monetized, they pretty much don't pay attention to you because you're not making the money. 
excuse me so yeah in either case let's go on let's go on and on and on and on i feel like i'm gonna sneeze all right let's see um let's see let's see the setup here is so different oh, okay it's going in reverse it's going in reverse so the new ones are at the top and the old ones are at the bottom so kiana nicole says good morning 40 fam bless the like button a wave good morning or bless the heart no monkey or devil 90 days what yeah 90 days and it shows on here i've got three viewers but it shows on here i've got only uh i've got two it doesn't matter because once i put it up here everybody's going to be able to see it anybody who's on facebook is going to be able to see me now because i don't normally do this and i'm recording this on my computer so i can upload to my channel here's the thing i can upload to my channel i just can't live stream ain't no monkey gonna stop no show we're gonna read the bible anyway you know it's a bible reading party i'm about to get it started and nothing gonna make me stop so chapter 10 we got chapter 10 going on in first kings and it's the visit of the queen sheba visit of queen sheba i'm gonna look here real quick because what you guys may or may not know elemental p q r s what you guys may or may not know and i doubt it's in here sheba the queen of sheba The Queen of Sheba. Here, oh, the Queen of Sheba's in here. I don't think they have it. But uh, my daughter's middle name is actually like another name for their, um, the Queen of Sheba. I found it once years ago when I named her and it's difficult for me to find anymore. But you have to like do research, research. Yeah, it's not in here. Anyways, the Queen of Sheba, since that's the first part, I'm going to start off here using my handy dandy compact Bible dictionary. And to the three people in the room, welcome, welcome. I do this every day, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. If YouTube won't let me do it, Facebook will let me do it. And if Facebook starts to have a problem, I'm going to find another way to read my Bible. So that's okay. Uh, let's see, Queen of Sheba, a queen who came to visit King Solomon. She tested him with hard questions and found that Solomon's wisdom and prosperity exceeded his fame. Some scholars believe she represented the region of Ethiopia, uh, south of Egypt, but others insist she ruled among the tribe of southwestern Arabia. In the New Testament, Jesus referred to her as the Queen of the South, who came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And so that's that. But anyways, my daughter's middle name is Makeda, Makeda, Makeda. And if you look that up, um, I know this has nothing to do with the Bible, but hey, Makeda, Queen of Sheba. There we go. Uh, I'll let you guys do the rest of the research on your own. But there you go. Queen of Sheba, Makeda. And that is my daughter's middle name. So even though her first name is not biblical, like my son, Jason, I didn't even know my son's name was biblical till I started reading about him in the New Testament uh, last month. But there we go. The Queen of Sheba figure mentioned in Hebrew Bible. Um, and yeah. So that's just a little, a little pop history, a little pop quiz, inter uh, interesting history for you. Since I'm starting off reading about the Queen of Sheba, I thought I'd mention it. But back to chapter 10, we got the visit of the Queen of Sheba. When the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, which brought honor to the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She arrived in Jerusalem with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices, large quantities of gold, and precious jewels. When she met with Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had on her mind. Solomon had answers for all her all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. And we know why, right? Because he prayed. I mean, he well, he didn't pray to God, but the Lord asked him, what do you want? What do you want? And he didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for fame. He didn't ask for victories over his enemies. He didn't ask for a long life. He asked for wisdom and he got everything else along with it. So he's the wisest person around. Uh, let's see. But you know what? Now that I'm reading in between the lines, Queen of Sheba must have been pretty smart too. 
because can't no dummy stump no smart person, right? You got to be a smart person to try to stump somebody and try to, you know, catch them up. But she must have been pretty wise and smart, too, because she kept coming up with all these hard questions. At least that's how I read it. Uh, let's see. Verse three. We're in chapter 10, verse three. Solomon had answers for all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen, queen of Sheba realized how very wise Solomon was and when she saw the palace he had built, she was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food on his tables, his organization, organization of his officials and their splendid clothing. The cupbearers and the burnt offerings Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. She exclaimed to the king, everything I heard in my country about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of it. Your wisdom and prosperity are far beyond what I was told. How happy your people must be. What a privilege for your officials to stand here day after day listening to your wisdom. Praise the Lord your God who delights in you and has placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king so you can rule with justice and righteousness. Verse 10, then she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices and precious jewels. Hey, that's the same amount he gave uh, King Tiram, uh, King Hiram. Mm. I'm just looking in the postscript to see if there's anything extra. In Hebrew, it would have been 120 talents or 4,000 kilograms. But in either case, still, I like, just noticed it's the same amount. So what's, what else is happening? In verse 10, she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices and precious jewels. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In addition, Hiram's ships brought gold from Ophir, and they also brought rich cargoes of red sandalwood and precious jewels. The king used the sandalwood to make railings for the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and to construct lyres and harps for the musicians. Never before or since has there been such a supply of sandalwood. Verse 13, King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba whatever she asked for. Besides all the customary gifts he had so generously given, then she and all her attendants returned to their own land. In verse 10, we've got Solomon's wealth and splendor. Each year, Solomon received about 25 tons of gold. This did not include the additional revenue he received from merchants and traders, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, each weighing more than 15 pounds. He also made 300 smaller shields of hammered gold, each weighing nearly 4 pounds. The king placed these shields in the place palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a huge throne decorated with ivory, and overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps and a rounded back. There were armrests on both sides of the seat and the figure of a lion stood on each side of the throne. I wish I could do a screen share with you guys, but I don't think I can. <gasps> I think I can. I just thought about it because I'm still using the same, <laughs> I'm still using the same uh, software. I could use my screen share. I can, I can. Yes, I can. Let me see something. Hot diggity dog. I guess I'm so thrown off from what's going on this morning. I forgot. Look, I could do my screen share. Hot diggity dog. I sure can. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Yes, I can do my screen share. Oh, YouTube, you got me thrown off this morning, but that's okay. Awesome. Let me see. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I'm listening in from my phone now to see what you guys see. Hooray! There we go. Yes. So anyways, <laughs> I got thrown off. I was thrown off. But I'm back on. Anyways, for anybody watching this for the first time, let me show, share with you really quick. This is the guide that I'm using. It is the woman's guide to reading the Bible in a year. And this is what I'm using to pace myself to read the Bible. Um, yeah, this is what I'm using. <laughs> oh boy, I was really thrown off. And I'm in week 24, 
been reading the Bible every day since January 1st of this year. And God willing, I'll be reading it every day until the end of the year, December 31st. I'm in week 24, like I said, and this is the this is how it looks. If you use the Kindle, if you download it from Kindle, this is what it's going to look like. Division and unity. That is what the theme is, like the overall theme. And then over here in this yellow kind of yellow orange box, this is what I'm reading every day. So here's Monday, here's Tuesday, here's Wednesday, here's Thursday, here's Friday, here's Saturday, here's Sunday. And then there's checkpoints on the right side of this little box. And the checkpoints are just like specific things that are going on that uh, the, the study guide is drawing attention to. Two golden calves. At some point, I'm going to talk about that. Bulls and Baal. At some point, I'm going to talk about that. A tired prophet is another checkpoint. The chief cornerstone is another uh, checkpoint and spiritual armor. Oh boy, I could have done this a long time ago. I totally forgot. Yeah, I totally forgot. Let me see. Yeah, so now I can show you guys on my side what's really going on. Instead of showing you the video from my phone. This is why, well, there is no why. Here's my channel. It's a verified channel, which means I give them all my, you know, personal information to prove I am who I am. Um, I don't have any copyright strikes. I don't have any guideline strikes. But if you look down here in red, I'm eligible for every, almost everything except for the ability to live stream has been revoked. You see that? My ability to live stream has been revoked. And then if you hit click more, they don't really tell you anything. They just they just um, give you a list of what to do and what not to do. And I, I pretty much, I've been a good girl. <laughs> I've been a good little girl and they, they restricted me. So yeah. That's what's going on. That's why I'm on Facebook. I try to go live. Look at that. And that's the message I got. Live streaming isn't available right now. Sorry, Kenya. <laughs> you cannot live stream. And then I did some, I did some uh, research to see why. And there's a, this has happened to quite a few people. I got a lot of people that I came up with and they don't have an answer for it. They just know that, that when you get banned, you get banned for 90 days. So that's that. Uh, let's see. What was I going to look up? I didn't want to, I didn't want to focus on that stuff too much. I didn't want to focus on that stuff too much, but I I just remember like, yeah, I can screen share because I've got my software on my, the software on my laptop. So let me see. We are in chapter 10. We just talked about Queen of Sheba. Um, let's see. Oh, we're talking about all this wealth that he's getting. Oh, that's what I was going to do. I was saying to myself, I wish I could show you guys like a picture. That would be cool to see that throne, right? Is that what I was trying, trying to look up? Then the king made a huge throne decorated with ivory, overlaid with fine gold. Um, the throne had six steps and a rounded back. There were armrests on both sides. And the figure of a lion stood on each side of the throne. There were also 12 other lions, one on each side of the six steps. Yeah, I think that's where I stopped. I don't remember why I was thinking to myself, oh, I wish I could show you guys a screen share. But, um... Either way, I'm glad that I remember. I do have that ability. Ooh, this looks nice. Let's see if I can give you guys a, a nice little look. A little peeky poo. Ooh, some of these are really nice. I'm going to do another screen share just so we can see this wealth and grandeur that he didn't even ask for. Remember, he didn't ask for this, but he got it. So here's another screen share looking at King Solomon's throne. We got this one here. Let's see. So those are the six steps. Ooh, look at that. Wow. See, we got the lions on either side. And it looks like there's some other animals here. Here's another replication of it. Got there the two lions, wing lions. Looks like some lion cubs here. 
That's very interesting. And look on the side. You see right here? This is what we read about, was it yesterday or two days ago? The wisdom of King Solomon, when the two prostitutes uh, both had a child and they were like, well, the baby's mine. Oh, the baby's mine. Solomon said, fine, we'll cut this live baby in half so each of you can have it. And the, the true mother said, no, no, let her have it. So there's that little, uh, I don't know what you would call that, a fresco or a mural, but yeah. I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to give you guys this this picture right here to look at while I am reading on in chapter 10. Right now I'm still on chapter 10 and verse 18. So you all look at this and I'm going to finish reading through chapter 10. So the king made a huge throne. This is 18 decorated with ivory and overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps and a rounded back. There were armrests on both sides of the seat and the figure of a lion stood on each side of the throne. There were also 12 other lions, one standing on each of the six steps. No other throne in all the world could be compared with it. In verse 21, it says, all of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid gold, as were all the utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. They're, they were not made of silver, for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. Wow, isn't that something? Like people trade silver and gold nowadays, but it was considered worthless then. The king had a fleet of trading ships that sailed with Hiram's fleet. King Hiram. Once every three years, the ships returned loaded with gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. People from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom of God that God had given him. Year after year, everyone who visited him uh, brought him gifts of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. Solomon built up a huge force of chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities and some of them near him in Jerusalem. The king made, a silver, made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone and valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Cilicia. The king's traders acquired them from Cilicia at the standard price. At that time, chariots from Egypt could be purchased for 600 pieces of silver and horses for 150 pieces of silver. They were then exported to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. So I'll bring you back. And that is chapter 10. That's all we got for chapter 10. Let me check in with the Facebook Live since I've been banned on YouTube. Uh, let's see. I really don't know how to use this thing. Oh, okay, that's the comment section for after the fact, I guess. And this is the part. I'm trying to make sure that I don't miss you guys if you're saying something. But I'm not used to this Facebook thing. All right. Uh, yes, yes, that is awesome. Okay. Cool. All right. So moving on to... Moving on to chapter 11, talking about Solomon's many wives. Now Solomon, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not Marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. <laughs> we were talking about chariots the other day, right? Remember how we were talking about chariots and horses? And uh, was that the whiz that said? I think the whiz said, you can only ride one horse at a time. <laughs> yeah. 
700 wives and 300 concubines. You can only be with one woman at a time. How would you even keep track of that many women? That's that's crazy. That is crazy. He had the wealth to take care of them, but that's not the point. Oh, we. Okay, so this is chapter 11, verse 3. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. Verse 4 says, in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God, as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech. Oh, we learned about Molech back in Genesis. Molech, that was the pagan god that they were sacrificing live babies to. It was like a large statue that was really an oven. And they were just throwing the babies in there and burning them up alive. How? How? How do you go from being faithful to God to, oh, yeah, okay, baby, yeah, I love you. I love you, too. Okay. Oh, we're going to go uh, worship this pagan god, Molech? Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. Well, what, so what are we supposed to do? What we do? We, we put our hands up and say hallelujah or something? Oh, no. We're going to throw some live babies in there. Oh, okay. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds good. Like, how? How do you turn? Oh, my goodness. How do you turn from? Okay, let me go on. Let me go on because you guys know I get off track sometimes. But we are in... Uh, and let me actually... I'm going to throw up some more imagery. I did this before a couple months ago. This was like months and months ago. We talked about Molech. And the Asherah, Asherah poles, remember those Asherah poles that was being talked about in Joshua? I think in Joshua. So we had the Asherah poles that were symbolic of the, the pagan god Ashtoreth. And then we got Molech. Ash. Ashtoreth. And Molech. I don't think there's ever been a search for those two together. Here we go. Oh, wow. So the worship of Molech included, what does that say? Sexual something. This is the one that I'm used to seeing. So I'm going to share this one with you guys. And then I'll do the asterisk one next. Hold on. Oh, where am I at? Okay. So this is Molech, as you can see here at the bottom. I'm trying to show it to you. So it says Molech, M-O-L-E-C-H. That's who I'm reading about in verse, verse 5. Chapter 11, verse 5. So Solomon, who has been brought up in the Jewish tradition... He knows what to do. He knows how to worship God. He, he, he has been taught well by his father. And before his father passed on, he gave him those final words like, you know, son, stay faithful. Make sure you're following the Lord. And um, yeah, but this is what he ends up doing in his old age because he's following, all, he, he's following behind so many women that he's, he's following into their ways. And I think that happens a lot of times in relationships love or what we think is love makes us start believing what the other person believes or how the other person believes and disregard some of our own core beliefs. So this is what's going on. Chapter four, or excuse me, chapter 11, verse four. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord, his God, as his father David had been. Solomon worshiped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians and Molech the detestable God of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Chemosh, the detestable God of Moab, and another for Molech, the detestable God of the Ammonites. So you guys see this thing, this Molech uh, pagan God, or the idol, um, there's people in the back and they're feeding the fire. They're putting wood in the back 
Um, we've got some drum players off to the side to keep the tempo or whatever's going on. We got some horn players up here. And you know what? I think I read, I read somewhere else. They're not dancing and, you know, like celebrating and making noise. You know why they're making so much noise? To cover up the screams of the crying babies that are being burned alive. Yeah, I hate to ruin your Tuesday morning, but that's what was going on with this particular pagan idol, Molech. That's Molech. That is somebody sacrificing a baby. They're at the top, standing there. And uh, yes, I'm pretty sure the screams of this baby being burned to death and alive uh, was quite terrible. And so they got all this drum playing and all these horns to to cover up the sound, um, these terrible cries. Uh, I had not heard of Chemosh before, so I'm going to see if I can find a picture of that. The Ashtoreth poles, I think I showed you guys before. So this is the Ash Ashtoreth. Let's see. That is the pagan goddess, Ashtoreth. And then there were Asherah poles or Ashtoreth poles. And then what does this other one say? Chemosh. And so he built these. Uh, he built an altar, Chemosh. Yes, I think Chemosh. Chemosh. The owl as an archetype exists throughout many cultures, but this owl has direct links to the worship of Ishtar, the queen of heaven. Chemosh was a god developed out of the primi primitive Semitic mother goddess, Ishtar, whose name bears Moabite stone. So there's, there's a lot of history going on here that you guys can look up. There's another one of Molech. Chemosh, Chemosh worship. This looks like some cards, some trading cards. Uh, if used by a Moabite, discard a hero regardless of protective abilities. If an OT idol or curse is active, you may under deck this card. I don't know if this is Dungeons and Dragons or what, but wow, I didn't know there was even like cards like this. So anyways, this is what's going on in chapter 11. This is this is where Solomon has ended up. He started off being extremely wise, and then somehow he ended up um, following after his 700 wives and worshiping how they worship and building idols for them and with them. Yeah. All right, so going on from chapter 11, verse 9. So at this point, let me back up. At this point in chapter 8, Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. In verse 9, the Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father, David, I will not do this while you're still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son. And even so, I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be king of one tribe. For the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. And then we've got Solomon's adversaries. Let's see. All right. 
give you guys just a little bit more imagery to look at and check out while I'm going on through chapter 11, which is talking about Solomon's adversaries. Then the Lord raised up Hadad, the Edomite, a member of Edom's royal family to be Solomon's adversary. Years before, David had defeated Edom. Joab, his army commander, had stayed to bury some of the Israelite soldiers who had died in battle. While there, they killed every male in Edom. Joab and the army of Israel had stayed there for six months, killing them. But Hadad and a few of his father's royal officials escaped and headed for Egypt. Hadad was just a boy at the time. They set out from Midian and went to Paran, where others joined them. Then they traveled to Egypt and went to Pharaoh, who gave them a home, food, and some land. Pharaoh grew very fond of Hadad, and he gave him his wife's sister in marriage. The sister of Queen Tapenes, she bore him a son named Jinubath. Tapenes raised him in Pharaoh's palace among Pharaoh's own sons. When the news reached Hadad in Egypt that David and his commander Joab were both dead, he said to Pharaoh, let me return to my own country. Why, Pharaoh asked him, what do you lack here that makes you want to go home? Nothing, he replied, but even so, please let me return home. God also raised up Rezan, son of Eliadad, or Eliada, as sons Solomon's adversary. Rezan had fled from his master, King Hadadezer of Zobah, and had become the leader of a gang of rebels. After David conquered Hadadezer, Rezan and his men fled to Damascus, where he became king. Rezan was Israel's bitter adversary for the rest of Solomon's reign, and he made trouble just as Hadad did. Rezan hated Israel intensely and continued to reign in Aram. Uh, Jeroboam rebels against Solomon is verse 26. Yeah, he started off so well. He was doing so well. Now he's got all these adversaries. Uh, in verse 26, Jer Jeroboam rebels against Solomon. Another rebel leader was Jeroboam, son of Nebit, one of Solomon's own officials. He came from the town of Zereda in Ephraim, and his mother was Zeroya, a widow. This is the story behind his rebellion. Solomon was rebuilding his, the supporting terraces and repairing the walls of the city of his father, David. Jeroboam was a very capable young man, and when Solomon saw how industrious he was, he put him in charge of the labor force from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph. One day, as Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh met him along the way. Ahijah was wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone in a field, and Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 of these pieces, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and I will give ten of the tribes to you, but I will leave one. I will leave him one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I've chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. For Solomon has abandoned me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites. He has not followed my ways and done what is pleasing in my sight. He has not obeyed my decrees and regulations as David his father did. But I will not take the entire kingdom from Solomon at this time for the sake of my servant David, the one whom I chose and who obeyed my commands and decrees. I will keep Solomon as leader for the rest of his life, but I will take the kingdom away from his son and give ten of the tribes to you. That is very symbolic, very symbolic, because he just came into this 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 reign of the kingdom like he just got it. Kind of like that new cloak the guy had. I would have been kind of upset, like, dude, this, I just got that. I just bought that. New cloak. You're just now putting on a cloak. You're putting on this, this thing. Solomon had just put on this responsibility, had just put on this royalty of this kingdom, and now, wow. Uh, let's see. I'm still in chapter 11. I'm almost done, though. I'm in chapter 11, verse 
35. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give 10 of the tribes to you. His son will have one tribe so that the descendants of David, my servant, will continue to reign, shining like a lamp in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen to be the place for my, for my name. And I will place you on the throne of Israel and you will rule over all that your heart desires. If you listen to what I tell you and follow my ways and do whatever I consider to be right, and if you obey my decrees and commands as my servant, servant David did, then I will always be with you. I will establish an enduring dynasty for you as I did for David, and I will give Israel to you. Because of Solomon's sin, I will punish the descendants of David, though not forever. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but he fled to King Shishak of Egypt and stayed there until Solomon died. He wasn't trying to hear that. He was like, first you ripped my clothes. Now you telling me I'm about to lose everything. Come here, I'm going to get you. <laughs> Ooh, Jeroboam was like, I'm out. Uh, let's see, this final part of chapter 11 is the summary, the summary of Solomon's reign. This is verse 41. The rest of the events in Solomon's reign, including all his deeds and his wisdom, are recorded in the book of the Acts of Solomon. Solomon ruled in Jerusalem over all Israel for 40 years. I love that. Let me see. For 40 years. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. 40 years. I never thought about 40 in particular, but since I've started my uh, main channel, I, I like it. There's lots of some symbolism and meaning there. But yeah, Solomon reigned for 40 years. Um, when he died, this is verse 43, when he died, he was buried in the city of David, named for his father. Then his son, Rehoboam, became the next king. Now, pop quiz. Pop quiz. We talked about this yesterday. The city of David is also known as... I'll let you guys think about that while I sip my now cold coffee. The city of David, and uh, matter of fact, I, I brought it up in my Bible dictionary too. The city of David is also called. Mm, yeah, first it was too hot. Now it's lukewarm. Ding, 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 ding. If you said Zion, you're right. If you said Zion, you are correct. Learned about that yesterday. Um, it was actually first mentioned, I think, in 1 Samuel, but I first paid attention to it yesterday. So the city of David, wow, I did spit on myself, didn't I? The city of David is also known as Zion. That area became to know, be known as Zion. Eventually the people, the Israelites, became known as Zion. And then God's kingdom eventually became known as Zion. So that was a little pop quiz review from yesterday. And now on to chapter 12, because that's what I'm doing, 10, 11, and 12, right? Let me look at my thing. Yes, today we're doing 10, 11, and 12. And I have a feeling we're about to hit a checkpoint. I have a feeling we're going to hit a checkpoint because we've already talked about those pagan gods and the sacrifices and offerings he's made. So I think we're either going to cover bulls and Baal, which was um, another pagan god, or we're going to cover the two golden calves. I don't know which one. Let's see. Uh, the Northern Tribes Revolt. I may be wrong. Let's we'll see. get rid of some of these tabs i had a lot of tabs open because i was trying to figure out youtube why i thought you loved me <laughs> youtube's like nope speaking of uh my main channel where i talk about business and entrepreneurship you know 40 entrepreneur drive um this is why it's important to spread you want to be focused on something i know this is not bible related but i'm gonna go there in life you want to stay focused on a particular goal, right? You want to stay focused on a particular goal, but you never want to put 100% of everything that you have in any one thing. If I totally, completely depended on YouTube and I didn't have a, a Facebook account, I'd be kind of up a creek right now, right? But even though I don't like Facebook like that, I'm glad that I have this account to fall back on. Even though I have you know, my main channel where I talk about this, I'm glad that I have my other channel. I don't know. I don't know if, if I got 
penalized for my Bible reading. I don't know if I got penalized for something else, but I'm kind of glad that I split my channels because I would hate to get penalized all the way around. It's, it's just, it's too interesting. Multiple income streams, making money in more than one way. In case one thing falls through or you get laid off or you get hurt from this one or you sick and tired of this one or this one, the benefits are right, whatever, have multiple streams of income and have multiple ways to, you know, reach your goals and your tasks. This is Opportunity Tuesday. This is a great way. I'll probably segue this into uh, my channel when I get off of here talking about multiple, multiple ways to do things. But yeah, uh, let's see. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's the point of me saying that. That is the point of me saying that. All right, chapter 12. I'm still trying to make sure I don't miss these comments. They're in a very strange place. Like they're not off to the side. Or are they? Is there a way I can look at this? No. I see my comments and then I see this. So let me see. Listening in the background, have to take care of my customers. Yes, that's awesome. I'm here. Just finished up my morning routine. Very, very smart. You have something to fall back on. Plan uh, A or B. Good to have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <sighs> you just never know. Which reminds me, I need to start doing some more auditions for my voiceover stuff, for my, my, narr my book narration, because... You just you need to have a lot of have as many opportunities come your way as possible. Opportunity Tuesday. I'm going to talk about that later when I when I get off of here. This is chapter 12. Chapter 12 is talking about the Northern Tribes Revolt. Revolt! Yeah! Mutiny. If they were on a boat, they would call that mutiny. Rehoboam went to Shechem. Rehoboam. Rehoboam was one of, it was Rehoboam and Jeroboam, right? Those were two brothers. And their father was, was that Solomon's sons? Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all the Israel, all Israel had gathered to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, I just, I'm just curious about something. I'm just so curious about something. Is this a public live feed or is it unlisted? Because I find it strange that not anybody has like not even stumbled across me on Facebook. And I wonder if I possibly put this in unlisted because I know I sent out I know I sent out the link. And I'm wondering if the people that came in came in because of the link or because they found me. Facebook is now live. I don't think you can do uh, unlisted here, can you? Unpublished after the fact? No, I don't want to do that. I want to stay all the way live. I want to be all the way live. Okay. I think I'm live. Yeah. Maybe people are just not interested or they're busy or they're sleeping in or they're doing their own Bible reading party. Got to think positive. That's that's the spirit. They're not in my Bible reading party because they're hosting their own Bible reading party. <laughs> Chapter 12, the Northern Tribes Revolt. Rehoboam went to Shechem where all Israel had gathered to make him king. When Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, heard of this, he returned from Egypt for he had fled to Egypt to escape the king, escape from King Solomon. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subject. Rehoboam replied, give me three days to think this over. Then I'll come back, then come back for my answer. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had counseled his father, Solomon. What is your advice, he asked. How should I answer these people? The older counselors replied, if, you're, if you are willing to be a servant to these people today and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. 
But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the young men who he had grown up with, uh, who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. What's your advice? He asked them, how should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? The young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. <laughs> what? <laughs> my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Why? Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people. He rejected the advice of the older counselors and followed the counsel of his younger advisors. He told the people, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Verse 15, so the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of the Lord. For it fulfilled the Lord's message to, message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. When all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to him, they responded, Down with the dynasty of David! We have no interest in, this, in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel! Look out for your own house, O David! So the people of Israel returned home. But Rehoboam continued to rule over the Israelites who lived in the towns of Judah. King Rehoboam sent Adoniram, who was in charge of the labor for force, to restore order, but the people of Israel stoned him to death. When this news reached King Rehoboam, he quickly jumped into his chariot and fled to Jerusalem, and to this day the northern tribes of Israel have refused to be ruled by a descendant of David. When the people of Israel learned of Jeroboam's return from Egypt, they called an assembly and made him king over all Israel. So only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the family of David. And in verse 21, we got Shemaiah's prophecy. Who is Shemaiah? When Rehoboam arrived at Jerusalem, he mobilized the men of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. 180,000 select troops to fight against the men of Israel to restore the kingdom to himself. But God said to Shemaiah, the man of God, Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the people of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says. Do not fight against your relatives, the Israelites. Go back home, for what has happened is my doing. So they obeyed the message of the Lord and went home as the Lord had commanded. In verse 25, Jeroboam makes gold calves. I told you, didn't I tell you? I said, we're going to hit a checkpoint today. Checkpoint, checkpoint, checkpoint. I told you. This is the checkpoint for today. Let me give you guys a, a quick screen share. Checkpoint, checkpoint, checkpoint. I told you, I told you, I told you. See over here in this orange, yellow kind of box? These are the checkpoints for today. Uh-oh. That's last week's. Hold on. I got to... I got a control plus. That's what I got to do. Control plus, control plus, control plus. And that will make it bigger for you to see. So that is the first checkpoint of this week. Two golden calves, two golden calves. So pay attention. This is going to be on a test. Just kidding. Here we go. Uh, verse 25 of chapter 12. Jeroboam makes gold calves. Jeroboam then built up the city of Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and it became his capital. Later, he went and built up the town of Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, unless I'm careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, they will again give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They'll kill me and make him their king instead. So on the advice of his counselors, the king made two gold calves. He said to the people, it, um, is, it is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. That church is too far. Let's come on over here. And, let me stop. 
I don't even go to church right now. <laughs> so I can't I can't pass judgment on anybody. But that's that's funny that um the temple, which Solomon painstakingly took, what was it, seven years? Seven years to make this temple. And he even said to the people, wherever you're at. Pray toward the temple. Isn't that what Solomon said? Like, was that yesterday or the day before? He had just said, I'm dedicating this temple. The Lord will always be with us. You know, wherever you are, whatever we're going through, just pray toward the temple. Wherever you're at, pray toward the temple. God will hear your prayers. And now Jeroboam is saying, no, it's too far. It's too far. It's too much trouble for you. That's what he's saying here in verse 28. It is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel, these are gods. These are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. He placed these calf idols in Bethel and in Dan at either end of his kingdom. But this became a great sin for the people worshiped the idols, traveling as far as north, uh, as far north as Dan to worship the one there. Jeroboam also erected buildings at the pagan shrines and ordained priests from the common people, those who were not from the priestly tribe of Levi. And Jeroboam instituted a religious festival in Bethel held on the 15th day of the eighth month uh, in imitation of the, this was an imitation of the annual fest festival of shelters in Judah. There at Bethel, he himself offered sacrifices to the calves he made. And he appointed priests for the pagan shrines he had made. So on the 15th day of the eighth month, a day that he himself had designated, not something from God, Jeroboam offered sacrifices on the altar, altar at Bethel. He instituted a religious festival for Israel, and he went up to the altar to burn incense. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the reading for today. That has been chapters 10, 11, and 12 of 1 Kings. There's something else going on about those calves. Um, calves, because I looked that up. I looked that up like a month or two ago. Calf worship, like when uh, Moses went up to Mount Sinai and was uh, speaking with God, waiting for those commandments or those commands. And he was up there for a long time. Remember, it's not like he just do, 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 and came right back. that. He was up there for a while, like I think even 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights, right? In either case, the people kind of lost faith. The people lost faith in Moses and they ended up taking all their gold earrings out and gold bracelets and everything. And they melted those down into golden calves. And I think we talked about this before. First, how long was Moses on Mount Sinai? Forty days, yeah. According to the biblical story, Moses departed to the mountain and stayed there for forty days and nights in order to receive the Ten Commandments, and he did so twice because he broke the first set of tablets. Remember, he went up, stayed, uh, hung out with God. <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be cool? I'm just chilling. Hey, what you doing? I'm just hanging out with my homeboy, your homeboy. Yeah, me and God. Well, I'm not trying to bring the Lord down, but I'm just saying they're that close. That he's hanging out, he's in the presence of God. And that's why when he came down, his face, his countenance was like, oh, like glowing, like, ah. <laughs> yeah. So he came down and he saw these people worshiping these golden calves. He was so mad. He was like, yeah. I did that once with my son's cell phone when he wasn't calling home because that made me very mad. I'm like, boy, I spent all this money on this phone and you're not answering it. When I call you, when I took the cell phone, I'm like, ah, just like Moses did. And then I thought about it like, mm, I paid for that and I destroyed it. Anyways, you guys know, you guys know how I get, but it really did happen like that. So according to, yeah, the biblical history, Moses was up there for 40 days, 40 nights. He came down. He found these people were worshiping these golden calves. And there's a deeper meaning about these golden calves. I can't remember what it was golden calf meaning and it has something to do with Egypt it has something to do with Egypt because they had been spending remember they had just come out of Egypt from years and years and decades excuse me of slavery in Egypt and they had been exposed to these Egyptian gods this these Egyptian ways and yeah that's where that golden calf mentality came from here we go. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at Britannica.com. 
just the first thing I came up with. You guys can do some more research on your own. But Britannica.com says, mentioned in Exodus, Exodus 32 and 1 Kings 12. Is that where we're at? That's where we're at right now. Uh, in the Old Testament, the worship of the golden calf is seen as a supreme act of apostasy. The rejection of a faith once confessed. Yes, I believe in the Lord. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in him. Oh, there's a golden calf. Nice, pretty, shiny. Like you, once you know better, you do better. You don't know better and then go back to your old ways. So that's what apostasy is. The rejection of a faith once confessed. The figure is probably a representation of the Egyptian bull god, Apis or Apis, in the earlier period of the Canaanite fertility god Baal in the latter. So that is another, we don't say it specifically right now. We're not saying it specifically, but that is one of the, that is one of the um, checkpoints. See right here? We're talking about two golden calves right now. And the calves represent, probably, probably represent that old uh, Egyptian god, what does it say, Apis or Apis, and has something to do with Baal. And so there we go. Calves, which are baby cows. Bulls, which are male uh, cows. I think we're still going to probably hit that one tomorrow. But that's interesting there. Golden calf. False god, especially wealth as an object of worship. An idol made by the Israelites when Moses went up to Mount Sinai in Hebrew. Um, I cannot and will not pronounce that. The sin of the calf. It's first mentioned in Exodus 32. Why was it a golden calf? It was a symbol of virility and strength associated with the Canaanite god El. And such idolatry would persist into the period of divided mon the divided monarchy. King Jeroboam, who we just talked about of the northern kingdom of Israel commissioned two golden calves for the sanctuary of Yahweh and Bethel and Dan to serve as the Lord's attendants. And yeah, there's some more there's some more questions that you guys can check out into your own time, but I just wanted to dive just a little deep into this whole golden calf thing to see like what's up with the calves. I, I don't get it. Ladies and gentlemen, that has been the reading for today. I did it. And as soon as I get done getting off of Facebook, I'm going to take this recording and I'm going to upload it to YouTube so the people that um, are not able to find me in other places because not everybody's on Facebook. I'm going to make sure that I still publish this to my YouTube channel, even though I have wrongly, wrongly been revoked. You see the smile on my face? I'm sincerely happy right now because I don't know, like I shouldn't be happy right now. I'm a little, I'm a little aggravated and I'm really curious because it's really curious. Like, how do you, that's like getting a red light ticket. You ever get those tickets in the mail? Well, maybe you guys haven't. That's like getting a red light ticket in the mail for running a red light. You know, they have, they have those cameras. That's like getting a red light ticket in the mail and you don't even own a car. And it's like, but I don't own a car. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's how I feel right now. Like I didn't, I didn't even do anything. So it's whatever. Anyways, let me wrap it up. Big ups, big ups, big ups to Kiana and Laverne for hanging out with me today. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, my apologies to the people who were not able to reach me today on the live stream. Um, a little bit of patience, hopefully within the next 30 minutes, this will be rendered maybe within the next hour, this will be rendered and it will be uploaded to YouTube. So even though you can't watch me live, you will be able to watch the replay. No matter what they try to can't make me go away. I read in the Bible. I'm liable to be happy no matter what they try to bring my way. Yes. Anyways, quick pray pray on our way way because it's Opportunity Tuesday. And I've already taken the opportunity to find ulterior methods to reach my goals. 
And I'm probably going to talk about that on the main channel in a little while. So for those of you who do not know me, I do have a YouTube channel on um, YouTube. It's called 40 Entrepreneur Drive, where I talk about business and entrepreneurship and other motivational things. Boy, my nose sure does flare, doesn't it? <laughs> you got to be of good cheer. That's my thing today. That's going to be my takeaway lesson. Even in bad circumstances, even when you are wrongly accused, even when you just, it's, it's unfair. The Bible even says this. You're supposed to, you're supposed to give praise to God, even when you're suffering. Give praise to God when you're being wrongly accused. Give praise to God when you are being unduly punished. Give praise to God when you are going through illness. Give praise to God when you are uh, suffering uh, been misaligned, been stolen from, been hurt. Give praise to God. And so I'm giving praise to God. Thank you, God. For no other reason, just because you are who you are. Just thank you. In other words, hallelujah. Yeah. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And that's how that goes. So, hey, devil. I rebuke you. Let's do a quick prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this awesome opportunity Tuesday that you've given to me today. I am thankful for my big brain because I smart enough to, <laughs> the, the big brain that you've given me and the intelligence you've given me and the persistence that you've given me and the ingenuity that you've given me to work out problems when they do come my way instead of giving up, being frustrated and being sad. That comes from you, and that is a blessing from you. And so I'm thankful. Thank you for my big brain. Thank you, Lord. I'm thankful for this opportunity to meet and greet other people who maybe, uh, you know, don't know me. And maybe they come across my YouTube. Uh, I say my YouTube. Maybe they come across my video here on Facebook. And that would be a great opportunity, not only for me, but for them to know you. And so it works out in the end anyways. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the freedom and Ability to read my Bible in the comfort of my own home without persecution and for the miracle of technology to reach out to people in other places and other spaces and read the Bible with them, even though we're in different time zones and places, whether they hear me now or they hear me later, we're still in the same zone reading about you in the word. And speaking of the word, I pray that everybody listening to this now or later, that they're motivated to pick up a Bible. Yes, yes, yes. Pick up a Bible, flip through it, read something, get something from get something from it, and maybe be inspired to read it a little bit more so they can understand it, so they can build their faith, so they can build their strength, so they can uh, find their purpose, and so that they can better understand you. That is my prayer, Lord. Amen. 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 A A Amen. So be it. That's what it, that's what the meaning says. Look it up. Amen means. Get her done. It is written. So be it. Done. And already. Like we say here in Texas. Already. Yep. Already. You guys, thank you so much. Uh, let me hurry up and get off of here. So I can. Um, let me get off of here so I can hurry up and upload this. It's already on my computer. I'm so happy. I got brick brain. I think. I think. If I can't do it this way, I'm going to do it this way. If I can't do it that way, I can do it this way. And I might not always get the exact same results, but I'm going to always get what I want. And if I don't get what I want, I'm going to get what I need. You feel me? All right. I'll see you guys on the next Bible reading party. Because this is where we get it started. On YouTube or Facebook, come and take a look and you will find me. Oh, yeah. I'm not sponsored by Broadway, but Broadway, you know where to find me.